guess the real reason, I guess I'll just dive right into this. Uh, the real reason, you know, we have you here today is uh, you are the president of um, North Carolina uh, Families Against Senseless Killings. Is that right? Well, it's Families Against Senseless Killings. Yes. Yes, I am president and CEO. Okay. Oh, the website is NC. Well, NC. that's our, yeah, well, you could say North Carolina. <laughs> that's why. That was the first thing I that's looked at in my notes. Mm -hmm. I'd make sure I got it right. That's our, that's our NCFAST, ncfast.org. Okay. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is uh, taking a toll this year on Greensboro. Uh, 65 this year we're at. Well, uh, it's gone up kind of since we talked. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yes. See, and, and I mean, it gets even worse, and mm -hmm. that's, um, and of course we know, you know, it's tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Yes. And it's you know the holiday season. Of course, that takes its own toll. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, we did, we had the, well, anyway, um, you know, this it's it's even different to to see. I, I happened to be at um, Moses Cone when I watched. Uh, one young man get rolled in, and he said, I'm about to pass out. Mm -hmm. And uh, watching the family show up, mm -hmm. and it just hits different. I mean, seeing numbers is one thing. Mm -hmm. When you see it firsthand, it just it hits differently. And I was just, I called, you know, I messaged you, and I messaged Mary Kay. Those are the first two people, y'all are the first two people I thought of mm -hmm. to shed unfortunate light on this. Um, but anyway, uh, can you, you know, I know you've been involved. I know you, you've done um, some walks, some advocacy. Let me start from the beginning. Yeah. I think your first part was spot on. Um, FAST, Families Against Senseless Killings, is something that came out of a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And um, my work in the community, I've always done work in the community. I'm, I'm currently still doing radio. Um, and through my radio show, I, that's my release and my getaway. That's my other ego that I can just get away from what's happening here lately. And what's happening here lately is what the billboard says, I'm tired, are you tired yet? Is the murders, the killings. My story began with my husband and I preparing his grandparents' home for our children to move into because they were teenagers, college, and um, we got a call and we were at Furniture Land South shopping for furniture for the, for the house for them. And we got a call and um, it was the police asking how soon could we get home, where were we? And we got home and they asked to see a picture of my son, Trey. And I showed it to them. And they said, I'm sorry to inform you that your son is dead. And I just hit the ground. My husband is a very proud Vietnam Marine. So he got me up off the ground with the other detective, and they got me in the house. And we sat there and pulled ourselves together because it seems like it's a dream. I mean, not, not us, not this family. You know, you hear about this, but no. And um, from that moment on, that's when everything just went into warp speed. And Trey was breaking up a fight. He was somewhere the night before, um, and these guys were getting into an altercation, and he tried to break them up. One of the gentlemen got very upset and pulled out his gun and just, Trey was in the middle of it and riddled him with bullets. And um, from that moment on, we had to go into something that we never thought we'd ever have to do. And that is one, bury a, a child, and two, look at a child that's been riddled with bullets, and three, figure out what's next. And um, they caught the person that did it. So then we had to go through a trial and sit there and look at this guy and look at his family and look at his family beg the judge for leniency. And my husband and I had both decided 
along with the district attorney, Bill Woods, who I love him. I love Bill. He was just absolutely un incredible. Um, my detectives were incredible. But before they got to the incredible part, I had to bring them to the reality that I'm not your everyday ordinary mom. I'm not one that you could tell if we hear something, we'll get in touch with you. I'm not the ordinary mom that's not going to want to know where are we now? Why can't I get a return phone call? So, and, and my husband being the type of man he is, he wasn't either. So we would go to the police department. We would show up and wait on the detective to come in. We would go to the district attorney's office and want to see Bill Woods. We wanted to do those things without appointments because we had never been through any of this. And when we tried to make an appointment, it, it, it didn't, it wasn't working. You know, we were being put off. That's what I felt. And I realized then that I'm not the only one feeling like this. There's got to be a lot of other parents that are going through this, but they don't know what to do or they don't know how to do it. So I'm one of those that'll pick up the phone and call Raleigh. I'll call the state office. I'll call, I'm one of those and someone's going to answer me because I believe I have the right to know the answers. Um, and from that point on, they realized this lady is serious and she will call anybody, the governor. I don't care um, because people are elected by the people and I am the people. And so from that point on, Things started rolling, and we were brought into a lot of meetings. We went to court. My husband and I decided that we weren't going to have our family show up. It was, it was already so much on them. So he and I, just us, were there in court that day. And we listened to everything. We saw everything. We, we had to see what happened. We had to understand that witnesses wouldn't show up because they feared for their life. We, we went through a lot. After it was all over, we had the wherewithal to have our child taken care of. We had him cremated. We were able to have him a service in the church that he grew up in, was baptized in and attended. We were able to deal with the clerk of court for his items, his car, his stuff. We were able to do all that. We had the wherewithal to do all that, but everybody doesn't. Fast came after that. That was my way of working through it. I actually had people in my life tell me, you know, Doc, you need to go and talk to somebody. You might need to look at, you know, therapy. You might need to go and seek help. And I'm sitting here looking at them. You have absolutely no idea what I feel or what has happened. Right now, I can't process it like that by talking to someone. If that was the case, I had all these other people I had been talking to over and over again. So what I had to do was, after my incident, people started coming up to me, other mothers. You know, same thing happened to me. Um, my child was killed, but they didn't find my the person that killed my son. or my child was killed. More and more people started reaching out to me, asking me, how did you get the police? Or how did you get this? Or how did you get that? And I realized there's a need. There's a need for the aftermath. And that's where FAST came in, Families Against Senseless Killings. And it's just not gun violence. To me, a senseless killing is a DWI. A senseless killing is a domestic violence. A senseless killing is, is, is drug overdose. Those are senseless. And families, when, you, when one person kills someone, you kill that person at the moment, but behind that person is a whole multitude of people. It's a, it's a whole family. It's, it's like going to the ER at the hospital and watching a family try to come in and see what's going on. And now you can only have two people in the ER Everybody else has to stay outside in your car. 
and folks are heated, they, they're, they're mad, they want to retaliate, they want to do something. So what we do is we teach them how to maneuver through the aftermath. One thing after what happened to us, Chief Thompson was the chief of police then, he would call me and he'd say, Doc, we've got someone that's been shot and killed in a certain area and the mom won't open up the door and talk to us. And I would get up out of my bed, I don't care what time of day or night it was, and I would go over there and I'd knock on the door and somebody would say, we told you we don't talk to anyone. And I'm like, this is, this is Dr. Iris Spencer. My baby was killed. I know what you feel. And they would crack that door and let me come in and close the door back. And once we get in behind those doors, I would grab them and hold them and we both would just cry because I actually knew what they felt. And then I'd whisper in that mom's ear, it's gonna hurt, it's never gonna go away, but it's time for you to get mad. It's time for you to start thinking clear because you got work to do now. You can't hide in this house. You gotta take care of business. And that's when it started with Chief Thompson. And he would call me in. And that's where it just started and just started. And so with FAST, we actually help those with the aftermath. I have a big problem with people complaining about the police I have a problem with anybody complaining about anybody if you've not done anything to help them. Right now the police are on what I called a mission of they are in reaction mode. They can't ever get proactive because it's too many things going on. So it takes the community, it takes those of us that are out here in the community that are willing to get out here in the community and help people. That's fast. Wow. You said a lot there. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, I dove in like hot and heavy, like right off the bat. I thought about a lot of things about housing to start this, and um, but I, I know you and uh, I go into the GOAT Awards, I remember, mm -hmm. and I know your mission, so I was like, I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, that is, you know, and I, I, it's amazing. I didn't think of all the other things, you know, because uh, we just, I guess we just saw the headline of this, you know, 65. Well, like you said, it's gone up since then. Um, you know, I was just thinking of gun violence, of course, but you, you've addressed so many other things. Um, overdoses, of course, is a big one, too. Exactly. Yeah. But that, I, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. you go ahead. No, I was thinking uh, the, the advocacy thing. Um, this is at a time when uh, a parent or a loved one is at their, their absolute weakest. Mm -hmm. And you know that and you've seen that. Mm -hmm. what, what are the... I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, when they're absolute weakest, what is it that's something that's the hardest thing you have to do, that yeah. you have to pull yourself yeah, out well, to yeah. do, write an obituary. Nobody thinks about that. You never think that you're gonna have to write an obituary about your child. That is one, one of my very dearest friends had to do that for me, Sheila Chang. She did that for me. She sat down with me and she talked to me about Trey. She talked to William about Trey. And from those conversations, she wrote his obituary. And we sat there and we read it and it was, it brought us to tears because it was him. That is one of the hardest things a parent I mean, you can easily write, they went to school here and they, they, they liked playing football and they, they enjoyed 
you know, traveling or something like that, but she wrote the essence of our son. And that's very hard to do. It is very hard to do. Um, can you tell us, I understand there was a, a candlelight vigil here recently. Mm -hmm. uh, it was earlier this month, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I, I'm sorry I missed it, but um, can you tell us about that? The, the candlelight vigil this past couple of weekends ago was called by Mary Nero, who is our victim advocate with the Greensboro Police Department. And it was the same thing as the billboard says, we're tired, are you tired yet? And it was a weekend of violence, a weekend of back-to-back -back killings and shootings and death. And it was all done in a weekend. It was a barrage of gunfire at a restaurant that the mayor had decided to do a ride along with the Greensboro Police Department on this particular night when it was just riddled with gunfire. That, I mean, they had no, did not matter who was walking past the restaurant, who was in their car, who was standing out in the parking lot, anything. They just drove through riddled with gunshots, came back and riddled through again. And that whole weekend, it was done in an area of town where people think they're safe. There is not a safe space. And the mayor was on a ride along and she saw it firsthand and sh it scared her. It, it was so scary. She had never seen that many shell casings and she had never witnessed anything like that. And then from that one, she went to another one and actually saw the family of the next person that had been killed. And she witnessed that. And her saying what she said on television bought all of what we've been working for so hard to light. And so they decided, we're gonna hold a candlelight visual we need people to realize this is what just happened in our city. And it was witnessed by the mayor. And that brought along this vigil. And we called out the names of all 65 people that have been murdered at that time. Um, and it was amazing to see that each name said and after each name, you know there are families after each name. So you've got 65 names. If each family member had five people, that's just tremendous. So they were hoping to bring about awareness, uh, bring about healing, prayer, and um, just let the community know we feel you, we hear you, we see you and we're going to do something about this one way or the other. We have got to do something about it. So that was that, that vigil. Mm -hmm. And it needed to be done. And it needs to not be where something so horrific happens that we have to do that. It needs to be done when one person is killed. When my son was murdered, I had my own vigil at Plaza downtown. And I invited anyone else that had had anyone murdered in their family was welcome to come. And that's when I met a lot of the mothers. It was, a, you had no idea it was that many mothers that had children, had lost children, especially to gun violence. So that's kind of what that vigil was from, that horrific weekend. What's it going to take, or, wh or what are some of the steps that you see can be done to uh, slow this trend down or stop it even? I, I, you know, people ask that question, and what comes to my mind is it's going to take all of us one. It's going to take people that we put into office to actually do something in that office that they hold. 
And it's going to take us to educate and pre prepare people that are called violent, violence interrupters. Though that is a group of people that you can train, teach how to, to de-escalate violence when they see it in their neighborhood, teach how to talk to people that they see maybe feeling like they need to go out and do something bad or retaliate for something. We need to train people to be able to talk people down. People that are just like everyday, ordinary people that live in neighborhoods that are tired of the violence. And we need to train people to do that. We need to help people that want to get a job, get jobs. We want to help people that want to have a home, a, a roof over their head, get that. We need to help people that need help with drug addiction. We need, we need to help. Right now, we are reacting to what's happening. But if we get in the ground floor and pull in people that want to learn how to de-escalate and want to learn how to take this down and then send them back out, it's kind of like the military. It it's, it's, it's really is a military tactic. They take you to basic training. They teach you how to do everything in basic training so that when they fly you to these countries to protect the U.S., they drop you or you land and you go out and you are an interrupter. It's the same principle. And it's sad that we got to equate it to the military. But if you train enough people to go out to say, you know, man, it ain't that serious. You don't need to go out and kill. I know you, I know you mad at old dude. You ain't got to go out and kill him. I mean, he's got five kids and, and his mom and, and all those folks. And then you're going to have all these people after you. Just calm down. Let's, let's, let's ride somewhere. Let's go somewhere. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's calm it down. You need some interrupters. That's my thought. Now, I'm sorry for touching the microphone, but that, no, that's, that's my that's thought. That's, that's, that's how I think. Yeah. Well, and I mean, um, you know, jumping off of that, I know you're no, you're no slouch yourself. I know that uh, you, even before all this, you are the type of person you, you like to get involved. Because when you said, um, you know, jobs and stuff, it made me think of your, your background. And um, you've been very involved in uh, Welfare Reform yes, Liaison. Yes, Welfare Reform Liaison Project, WRLP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that is, and that's very much, um, I mean, there's several avenues to that, but one of the avenues is, is training and, and mm -hmm. housing and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's an ex extremely good program. It's uh, funded by the federal government, and they have programs available for those that want to go and better themselves. It's, it's um, based off of where you are financially, um, your income, it's an income-based program. Uh, so that is a great program. In, in fastest case, I can't do anything income-based because anybody, anybody can come and learn how to be an interrupter. Um, and if there are organizations and other nonprofits that we can work with and nonprofits that can come in and say, we can take that portion of it or we can do that portion of it and really do it and do it well, I can see this being something that could possibly be a model that maybe we could take somewhere else. There's a lot of people, and I tell people this all the time, it's sometimes you're scared to say what you want to do or say what you think should be done because you feel as though someone's going to steal your idea. Nobody can steal, they can steal your idea, but they can't steal your concept. I've got it in my head, and I know that if we put it into play, at least it gives us something to do. Because right now, we're just 
trying to do this, and trying to do this, and trying to do this. Let's put something in place for a long enough period of time to get at least 100 people on the ground marching as an interim. Let's see, you know, let's try something. So yes, my background started, my background actually started in radio management, but <laughs> well, I know, that's, I would, and I, that's media. Yeah. So, and it goes back to management, media, communications, the, the, the whole thing kind of plays within itself. I'm not one that, that's not going to speak up or speak out because I really feel like somebody's got to do it. And, and if you don't, then you, you're hoping the next person will do it. I don't want to be that person that you hope. I'm not going to be based on anybody's hope. Yeah, that why can't someone else do it? I can't, kind of, I can't live like that. Yeah, well, somebody's got to be somebody else, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and I was also thinking of, you know, when you said earlier, uh, you know, why don't you, somebody told you, you know, why don't you need to see a therapist or <laughs> mm -hmm. something. And it made me think of how people just, they have an outlook in different ways or they have an outlet in different ways. Mm -hmm. And some people like paint. And I would think, you know, given your background and the way, how you operate, this is sort of your artwork. This organization, um, Senseless Killing, you know, this is your artwork and this is how you're sort of painting. This is sort of your therapy. If, if I had to look at it like that, then I would say yes. This is my therapy from my son. This is his work. And, and he's showing me, and a lot of people may say, oh, here she goes, but I don't care. Trey has a lot to do with this, and this would never exist if he hadn't have been in it. And because of his heart, and him trying to do something good, I take that and it's resonated with me. And so if you want to call it my art or my therapy, my whatever, all I know is it's the right thing to do. And, and if it wasn't, I think I would have been shut down by now. <laughs> um, um, also, I, I, I didn't mention this earlier, um, uh, congratulations on the Woman of the Year Award. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Excuse trying me. Trying to give a more positive uh, note here. But, um, <coughs> you have to cut no, that card. Right. Thank that's you. Right. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't offer you a water. Right? No, I'm <laughs> fine. I'm just dying of thirst here. <laughs> no, just teasing. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, Fox 8. Yeah, yeah, Fox 8. Yeah, congratulations on that. Thank you. That was uh, last year, and, and this year they're now um, taking nominations for the new Woman of the Year. But just recently, two days ago, well, today is Wednesday, two days ago, I received an award out at, um, for a philanthropy award at um, Randover the other day by, by and it was AFP Philanthropy, National Philanthropy Association, and that just blew my mind. For the work I do in the community. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you've, I mean, you've certainly done a lot. Um, you've been the Wild Irish Rose. For yeah, I'm still the Wild <laughs> Irish Rose. One of the things I'm proud of is the award I received from Barack Obama, though, um, the Champion of Change Award. And it was, it's a funny story. I'm sitting in my office at Welfare Reform, and my secretary comes in and he says, Dr. Spencer, you, the there's a call for you. And I'm like, okay, who is it? And he said, oh, it's the White House. I'm like, you guys don't have anything else to do today, but pick with me. No, seriously, Dr. Spencer, someone from the White House is calling. Really? Seriously, Dr. Spencer? I said, okay, put them through. So I answer, I said, Dr. Spencer, may I help you? And they say their name, the press secretary, and with, with the White House in Washington, D.C. And I'm like, okay, who is this? And they go through this whole litany, and I'm like, this is really the White House in Washington, D.C., on Pennsylvania Avenue? <laughs> and then, yes, ma'am, you have been selected um, Barack Obama's um, um, of the Year Award for Champion of Change Award. And we'd like to fly you and a guest, I said, well, that would be my husband, to Washington, D.C. to accept that award. And that was just, 
you know, things that you do, I've always believed in, we have been put on this earth to take care of the least of these. That is what we're really here for. And I, I, you know, regardless of what anyone thinks, that is why we're here. And that's what we're supposed to do. And so to get an award for something that you're supposed to do just blows me away. But then my husband tells me all the time, honey, that's true, but there's a lot of people that are not doing that. And so thus, it just, things like that to me, you're supposed to do these things. You're supposed to help a friend in need. You're supposed to be good hearted. You're supposed to take up for people, go for the underdog. You're supposed to, you know, that's just me. <laughs> well, yeah, I, and I guess, I mean, you know, and I always thought of this in, in kind of different ways. Like, uh, you know, I grew up Christian mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you're not supposed to like gloat or anything. So I always thought of, I, I think we probably think of it kind of in the same way, like receiving award is so, and I just never really thought much of receiving an award or anything. But, um, you know, in recent years, I guess it's uh, shining a light on an example that, that somebody has to be that example, you know. And that's, that's the way that's my husband explains it to <laughs> me. He does, he says, you just have to understand that there's more people that don't do that than people that do. Yeah, and I guess it's just because, uh, I mean, I guess maybe that's just the human nature factor of it. Yeah, is, I don't want to get involved. Or, yeah, we're just involved yeah, in our I own I want to be in my own little box. When I go home, I want to be at home. I don't want anybody bothering me. I'm just, you know, and I just can't sit there and watch somebody do someone bad. I can't watch someone owe somebody something and, and a person is going through a whole lot just to get it, a person that has worked so hard and the people have not paid them, that stuff like that upsets me because I watch this person work so hard and they're expecting to get paid and now they're having to chase down their check. I'm that child of God that will get in the car and ride with them to go find their check. I'm just, it's just not right and I'm one of those people, I'm, that's just me. Um, you, you spoke of your husband. Tell me about your husband. Tell me about how y'all mm. met. Oh, oh, William and I met um, years and years and years and years ago, and um, he had gotten in from Viet. He was back from Vietnam, and um, he had gone to. He was using his GI, and he was back at A&T. He's much older than I am, and um, we met. Our, went into the student union one day at A&T, and all these students, was a, was, it was a big crowd of students, and they were all like, um, and I'm with a girlfriend, and she says, oh my God, what's going on? So I go, and we get through the crowd, and these older gentlemen that had all been to Vietnam, and they were so cool, and they were like, just cool, were sitting around talking about their experiences, and talking about life. And they had stopped all the students in, that were walking through it, just stopped and was chilling and was listening to them. Well, my girlfriend got enamored by it and I was hungry, so I went and got me a sandwich in the union. And then later on, we got invited to go and listen to some more talk and stuff. And then, you know, he um, and I met and started talking to each other. And this was like so long ago. And I had been mad at my mom and dad because I'm that spoiled chick. And they had told me I couldn't do something. I was in college, and when you're in college and you get that summer break and you go home, you don't understand why you can't stay out all night like you did when you was in college. And my parents were, no, when you live under our rules, you come in at a certain time. Well, I had stayed out. Now, I'm in college, but I'm home, and I got in after curfew, and they went off on me and got upset with me. and. So I left and I was so mad. And so I was telling him this story. And um, he asked me to ride with him to the store. And I rode with him to the store. And he had been listening to me and asking me questions. So where do you live? Where'd you grow up? And next thing I know, he's pulling up to my parents' house. And he says, get out the car. You don't have but one mom and dad. And I'm like looking at this guy and I'm going, you serious? And I got out the car and there's my mom and dad in. They're like, oh, and so 
probably about eight years after that, I saw him at a dance and um, we danced and he made me remember who he was. And after that, we started dating. And then he flew me to the Bahamas, asked me to marry him, and it's been wonderful ever since. And how long have y'all been married? 22 years. 22 years. Mm -hmm. What does it take to have a, because I could tell by the way you're answering, I could tell by the way you, you talk about him, you have a very good marriage. Um, what does it take to have a decent, a good marriage of 22 years? I think it takes listening skills. You've got to listen to each other and, and you've got to realize that is this a person, my husband is so military, Sergeant, Marine Corps. You know, when you've got a man that looks at you and says, I'll take a bullet for you. That does a whole thing to you. At, and there was nowhere I couldn't go with him and didn't feel safe. There was nowhere I couldn't, you know, there's nowhere he wouldn't take me. There was, there was none of that, no, nowhere. And when you've got someone like that in your life that makes you feel like, I got you. And whatever you want to try, I'll, I'll help you. I'll, I'll push you. I'll get you there. You, you, you should have a doctorate degree. Really, William, really? You should. You're gonna get it. He pushed me there. He did that. So he's, it takes someone that listens and pushes you. Whether you wanna be pushed or not, they see something you don't see. And sometimes it takes a person that sees something that you don't see and then when you get to there, you're like, wow, wow, thank you. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I heard it before, it's like you're not falling in love with that person, you're falling in love with the person they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. or that they're trying to that be, they're I trying. should say. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it the way you just described it, the person that they see. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. that somebody else sees inside of you and they're trying to make that manifest. I know I asked him when we were dating one day, I said, what, what are we doing? What, what's going on? He says, I'm bringing truth to your life. That's deep. I had to call my mother and ask her what that meant. She said, you'll find out because he's not going anywhere. So even your mother knew. Yeah, and my oh, mom. 85 and my dad's 90 and they're still here and they love my husband dearly 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 they they say that he's I'm a very strong-willed woman and it was going to take someone like a sergeant in the Marine Corps <laughs> but it, it was going to take someone that could tell me wait a minute let me tell you what I see let me tell you what you're going to do not what I think you should do let me tell you what you're gonna do. And you do it. <laughs> yeah. So he pushed you into your, um, or he drove you to your, <laughs> uh, your doctorate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which was in uh, humanities? No, nope, my doctorate's in management. Business. Management, I'm sorry. And my master's is in humanities. Master's in humanities, mm -hmm. okay. So you went some different routes between your- uh, Undergrad and yeah. master's. And, and the reason why I did that was because I thought, hmm, my undergrad A A and T is in African American Studies. I was the first African American to grad, the first graduate of the African American Studies at A and T State University under the Liberal Studies program. And after that, I'm just so happy. My husband says, "Okay, what you gonna do now?" Well, I don't know. We'll think about it. No, no. You're gonna keep going. You keep going where? You're gonna get your masters. I'm like, no, 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 you're gonna get your masters, why not? What else you got to do? So I talked to several friends of mine and, and one dear friend of mine, Dr. Deborah Jones, who was a principal here at, at Greensboro, as my cousin, she said, you get 
you follow a different path for each one of the degrees that you get so that when all they come together, they all work together. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, you'll understand it when you see it. And so when I applied and I saw the humanities and I read about humanities and I knew what kind of person my heart was and that was me. And so I came out of African American studies. I took a master's in humanities about humans, about feelings, about caring for one another. I, you know, I just came out of learning about the diaspora and I go into this and how to bring all people together. You know, all types of people. It doesn't matter who you love. It doesn't matter any of that. It's humanities. And from that, the way I picked management was, you've got to be able to manage all this. And business came to mind. Businessman, you can manage all of this. And that's how I got a doctorate in business management. So she, ta she told me, you don't stick with one thing each time. You make yourself well-rounded. And that's what I did. Yeah, and that really speaks to who you are. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, that's that's how I did it. Sometimes I look back at it and I, I thank her profusely every time I talk to her because I use every bit of that. I use all of that. I, I use all of that. I sit and I listen to people that think that they understand um, and they have their way of thinking, which everyone should. But I know what my studies taught me and I know what my research taught me. And I know what staying up 24 hours a day for two and three weeks, trying to type papers and thesis and dissertations and IRB taught me. And I realized that I've fallen back on all of that. FASC, it's, it's, it, FASC has put all of that in FASC, all of it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that really speaks to who you are. That's just remarkable. Your story is incredible. And you're the only one that have it. <laughs> <laughs> no one's no one's talked to me like this. No one. No. What do you mean? No one sat down and asked about the essence of Dr. Spencer. The essence of Dr. Spencer. Mm -hmm. They just want to know the Dr. Spencer now. Well, you, um, I'm speechless, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I went back, yeah, I went back and I watched uh, some, well, let's start here. I remember in, uh, John told me about the GOAT Awards. Yes, that's coming up. Yes, okay, so we could talk about that. Uh, okay. John told me about that, and um, man, last year was incredible. And this year's going to be even bigger. Yeah, I mean, not only was it just you had, um, you know, the awards, you had the incredible performances. Um, when that, and they were local. Yeah, when that uh, young, I was, I was like, okay, the, the, the Michael Jackson impersonator. But and Jane Trinette. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then that young lady, and I cannot remember, I'm sorry, this has been that's a year her, the now. That young lady that sang? Yes. That's her. And, oh my God, what a, like, I was blown away. Mm -hmm. And it was different watching on the video. Like, when I was there, like, Oh, my soul shook. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I like, I, I still have that video. We mm -hmm. couldn't play it on the air, you know, obviously copyright reasons, but I was like, ooh, oh, man, that was, see, and I touched my mic now, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, that was something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and the Go to Wars this year will be, it's going to be MLK weekend again. We're calling for another ceasefire weekend. It'll be that Saturday, uh, January 13th. Hope you guys come out and do the exact same thing all over again. I know John. 
I know you guys are coming. <laughs> and um, we're, we're now currently doing, and I would love to send you the, um, the flyer so that maybe you can put it on um, the screen for the GOAT Awards, but it's the greatest of all time. The mayor has, again, it's proclamation for it. Um, and we'll give out trophies for the best shoe shiner, the best chicken fryer, uh, the best hairstylist, barber, and just want to thank those that never get thanked, you know, just the folks that are out here every day working, just want to give them an award. And then we're looking at, uh, we're doing some extra specials. Anyone that buys a ticket this year, and the tickets are still $18.50, everything we try to keep under $20. So, because we want everyone to come. And so this year, one lucky person that buys a ticket that's sitting in the audience will leave with $500 cash. And then we're gonna give away three trips to the islands to somebody in the audience, three different folks. Best dressed female, best dressed male, best dressed couple. And then we're gonna have some surprise um, performers this year, again. That's amazing. Um and what do, what, do you have the dates that year? It's January 13th. January 13th. Carolina Theater. Okay. The most beautiful theater in Greensboro. It's absolutely. And she just turned 96 years old. Yeah, actually, uh, it was um, October 31st. Mm -hmm. Halloween. Yeah, Halloween. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So uh, we're looking forward to that night. It's a formal again. And um, the, it'll be, it'll, doors open at 7 and the show will start at eight. We like for people to get there a little early, give them a cocktail and take pictures and just have a really nice evening. Yeah. It's hard to believe that just came up again. I know. I, I didn't even realize how close it was. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing, it's actually a really good thing we did this program to um, get that out. We'll post the dates and everything. Um, all right, well that's good. Are there, is there anything else, um, any other events, anything else uh, you wanna address anything else you want to talk about that I haven't mentioned? No, I, I can't think of anything else. You pretty much was very thorough. <laughs> um, I just would like to say that um, Cable 8 television, I like what you do. And for you to sit down and do this interview and get me to sit here this long and do this, Kudos. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank, thank you, you for being here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, when we heard your story, um, John said, we got to go to this. This is a, you, you have to go to this. I don't care what else you got, you got to go to this GOAT Awards. So it's like, all right, we'll, we'll make it happen. You got to make it happen. All right. Well, please put it on your calendar <laughs> for, for 2024. Yeah, yeah, th yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for telling your story. Um, Thank you for uh, you know all you do for the community and all you're doing for all these families because um, you know they need somebody by their side and uh, I'm glad you had that that vision and uh, we're glad for your husband too to push you oh, and yeah. uh, to be there by you because this has been this has been a journey that you've yes, been on. Yes, it has. And, it's a uh, journey. And I'm glad to have the essence. <laughs> That's what we'll call this pretty the essence it's of nice. the Wild Irish Rose. Rose. Oh. Hey, oh, can you sign us off with a little Wild Irish oh, Rose? Oh, you want me to sign Yeah, you? I thought about this today. Okay. Um, and they'll, they'll, the, Monica is, the moniker is Cable 8 Greensboro mm -hmm. Television, or is it Greensboro Television Cable 8? Uh, Cable 8 Greensboro Community Television. Okay. And you've been watching Cable 8. Greensboro Community Television. See you soon. Peace. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, You're you welcome. are the best. You You're know that? Welcome. Thank you.